Hello, I'm Jerry Varnado, pastor at Raised United Methodist Church in Oconee County, Georgia. And I'll just welcome you. Uh, thank you for joining us for our Wednesday Bible study. Now, we have just finished studying Paul's letter to the Colossians. And tonight, I thought it fitting uh, that we would study Paul's letter to Philemon. Uh, this is a short, just 25 verses uh, in the whole letter. It is a companion letter to Colossians, most likely delivered simultaneously with the letter to the Colossians. So I think it's appropriate to turn to it now. But it's also, I think, an important message for America at this particular time because it addresses the subject of slavery. Now, some are critical of the Bible because it does not condemn slavery or even openly deal with it, even though it was very common and accepted in the biblical culture. But I think you'll see in this letter uh, that Paul does address the subject and, uh, and emphatically. Uh, first, let's look, if you've got your Bibles with you, and I hope you always do uh, when we come to Bible study, if you get your Bibles and turn to Philemon, and, uh, and we'll cover the first three verses as a group to start with. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our uh, fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul here gives his usual salutation where he names the intended recipients. The primary recipient, of course, is Philemon. But he also addresses the letter to Aphia and Archippus and then the whole church that meets uh, in their home. That would, of course, include Philemon, who was a member of that church. Uh, though it doesn't say it in the text, we need to understand that the common practice was to read letters from the apostles uh, openly uh, in the church. And the, the person who came to deliver that letter actually uh, read the letter uh, in, in the presence of the whole body. All right, now let's look to verses 4 through 7. Paul continues, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of, Lord's, of the Lord's people. Now, Paul gives his standard, again, thanksgiving and assurance of his prayers. And in verse 7, uh, it appears that these words are directed primarily to Philemon. It doesn't seem to be a letter addressed to the whole church, just to Philemon. In fact, when you read it carefully, it all seems directed to him, except the very beginning and the very end. Uh, yet, it is read publicly in the church. Now, I say that it's primary to him because if you look at the word that we translate you in verses 3 and verse 22 and 25, those are plural, you in, in the plural sense. But all other 16 occurrences of the word we translate you are singular. This letter is directed to Philemon. Uh, but he is making sure that it's read before the whole church because he wants to make the issue or the issues discussed in the letter public and not just something for Philemon to consider personally. Now, first of all, he commends Philemon for his love, faith, and his partnership with Paul in the gospel and for refreshing the hearts of God's people. So apparently he 
has some position in the church where he addresses the church at times. Now, if you have a hard word uh, for someone, I think it's probably helpful, I think this is what Paul is doing, to, it, it's helpful to just stroke them a little bit before, before you unload on them, before you deliver that word. You try to build them up so that the hard word will not flatten them uh, nor enrage them, make them angry at you. Note particularly in verse 5, Paul says, I hear about your faith for all God's people, about your love for all God's people, all inclusive. I think he, if Paul had been there, he would, have, he would have dragged that all out just like I did. Now let's turn to verse 8 through 11. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent. So that any favor you do would seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason... He was separated you from a little while, was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Excuse me, I did read a little further than, than I ha had intended, but let's look at verse 8 through 11 for a minute. Now Paul begins to unload his hard word. He says that he has authority to order Philemon to do what he ought to do, but prefers to appeal to him on the basis of love rather than authority. Now, at, at this point in the reading of this letter, Philemon may be the only one in the church who knows what's coming next. He has undoubtedly by this time seen Onesimus, who came with Tychicus to deliver the letter. Now Onesimus was a runaway slave who somehow came in contact with Paul and was converted to Christianity. Thus Paul's reference to him as his son. But his true owner and master is Philemon. Paul says formerly he was useless to you and that was basically because he ran away and, and Philemon didn't know where he was. He said, but now he has become useful to both you and me. And then he delivers the hard word uh, that uh, he wants to set him free. Now, Paul is not only at, now this is in verses 12 through 16. Uh, Paul is not only asking Philemon to give Onesimus his freedom but to accept him as a brother. Now, Paul said, I could have just kept him here with me. He said, but that wouldn't have been right without your consent. You see, Paul had to do what was right if he was going to ask Philemon to do what was right. And the law at that time required a person to return a runaway slave to his master. Now, let's pick up the reading in seven, verse 17 through the end of the letter. So, 
if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so, so do Mark, uh, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. Now Paul says that he should also welcome Onesimus, just as you welcome me. Give him the same courtesies you would give to me. Now, verse 18 suggests that Onesimus may have taken something belonging to Philemon when he ran away. Uh, maybe he took some money or some property he could sell so he'd have money to, to, to run away from the slavery he was trapped in. Now, Paul is really, <laughs> is real tricky here, isn't he? He said, you just charge it to my account. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. Now, all of this was read before the whole church. Can't you just feel the pressure on Philemon as he ponders how he's going to respond to Paul's request? And Paul again strokes Philemon a bit, expressing his confidence that Philemon will do uh, as was requested. He will do what is right. The only thing that is right is obvious, and that is to give Onesimus his freedom, to end the hold slavery has on his life. And Paul says, I know you'll do that, and that you'll even do more uh, than, than what I ask. And then he closes his comments to Philemon in a very personal way by asking him, to get a guest room ready so because he's coming to visit. And then, of course, as he usually does, he mentions those who are with him. Now, here's what is pertinent to our time, I think. Paul, Paul knew that slavery was so entrenched in that society that it could not be eradicated by the political process alone. Besides that, the Christian church at this point is a small, fledging movement it had no political power or influence and had minimal resources. It had to pick its fights carefully. The calling of the church was to win people to Jesus. Yes, the mission was to transform the world, but it was by getting people to Jesus so he could change their hearts and transform their lives. No, the New Testament does not directly condemn and call for the abolition of slavery. But that doesn't mean it is silent on the subject. Jesus did say in John 8, 36, So when the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And we've all taken that to mean free personally, and I think that's the primary focus of it. Your freedom in your own heart, in your own mind. But Philemon says to me, that the freedom declared through the Christian movement is also freedom from bondage to other human beings. Now, of course, we don't know for sure that Philemon freed Onesimus. But we do know that Paul set him up so that he had no other honorable option. He made it public and he made it clear what the right thing to do was. Now, we ended slavery in America in 1865 by governmental decree. That was the right thing to do. But many of the people's hearts in that time were not right. And that action helped spawn a civil war that cost us dearly, including more than 600 
600,000 lives. 600,000 people died in that conflict. Now, we abolished slavery by law, but it's still haunting us 155 years later because the law doesn't change the hearts of the people. And the hearts of many were not right then. Some are not right now. Well, we did get it right in the beginning. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights um, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. That's the law of the land. But history has proven that all of our hearts have never been in line with that law. Many in our country now are still in bondage to hatred, fears, or racial prejudice, which no law can abolish. You see, if we want to be free, we have to come to Jesus. He's the only one I know of that can change a human heart, that can transform us on the inside. We have to come to Jesus. Because when Jesus sets us free, we will be free indeed. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining our Bible study this evening. I hope you found it encouraging and uh, found a word that would touch your heart and help you as we all seek to grow in our faith and be mature Christians in this world. And uh, just hope that you'll also join us on Sunday morning for our online service. I want all of you to know we are making every reasonable effort to resume some level of in-person worship, and we will do so as soon as the weather and the pandemic permit. Well, good night to you. Remember, God loves you, and so does this preacher. <laughs>